Hello, this is Dr. Court Lewis. I'm the author of The Real Meaning of Doctor Who from Open Universe Press, uh, located in Chicago, uh, in LaSalle, uh, Illinois. So anyway, uh, this is the, I guess, probably the last lecture of my series. I think I'm going to tie together the last couple of chapters uh, because, because of their relevance and because right at this point, I, I I'm, I hope you're challenged enough to be reading it yourself. And if you have any specific questions, you can always reach out to me. Uh, you can look me up at uh, Mississippi State Community College and you can find my email address there. And of course you can interact with me, um, I guess on Facebook uh, through uh, Cortland D. Lewis or uh, the Doctor Who and Philosophy page. Um, unless something happens in terms of my connection to them. But anyway, um, feel free to reach out to me. I hope you've enjoyed these. I hope they're helpful. So uh, chapter six, this is the beginning of part three of the book, Beyond Everything. And it contains two chapters. Uh, one, chapter six deals with religion, loss, and the afterlife. And then uh, chapter seven deals with space-time knowledge and those fun things. Uh, so anyway, I know I could spend like a ton of time, uh, but you know, some reason I think that uh, subjects we could spend a ton of time on, it's better to be short and succinct and then follow it up with other stuff. So regardless, uh, religion, loss, and the afterlife, chapter six of The Real Meaning of Doctor Who. Well, uh, the reason I talk about religion is the fact that there are some people who claim or have claimed that Doctor Who is a religion. Uh, PBS uh, Idea Channel is the Doctor Who a religion, provides a neat overview of what counts as a religion and uh, how uh, Doctor Who seems to fit those characteristics. If you've ever been to conventions, right, they feel very sacred, right? They're really interesting. There's a great communal atmosphere. And unless you're in a really heated debate uh, on, you know, your favorite doctor or something like that, uh, they're, they're usually uh, very fun and uh, very enlightening. So it feels a lot like a religious atmosphere. And uh, by religion, I simply mean these are human actions that are dedicated to the worship of something. Um, in fact, that something uh, which many uh, philosophers of religion uh, will, is what many philosophers of religion will call the divine. And it's in fact that notion of the divine that I feel undermines any claims for Doctor Who or any popular culture icon to serve as a religion. Now, again, I could be wrong, and by the end of the chapter, that's exactly what I say. I could be wrong. If you want to call it a religion and live your life according to the principles of Doctor Who, that's a okay. The world needs more people engaged and in life and making sure that they themselves and others are flourishing. So kudos to you. For me, it's best understood as a philosophy instead of a religion. And, and that's because for me, religion requires that there be the possibility of the existence of something unseen, something transcendent or at least difficult uh, beyond our normal perceptual abilities. And that's typically called the divine. Um, and now I want to chase that rabbit about transcendentalness um, because, you know, part of me says uh, the divine needs to be transcendent, but then another part of me says that the divine needs to, we need to have access to the divine in some way. But anyway, huge rabbits, we could spend entire classes, entire degrees looking at that. For you who are interested in the book, those of you who are actually reading in the book, you'll see that I provide two lists, uh, one from Lewis Hopp, the other from uh, Nini and Smart, um, two well-respected uh, scholars working in the philosophy of religion or comparative religions. And they provide different lists of what makes a world religion a world religion or what makes a religion a religion. And in both of them, even though their lists are somewhat different, uh, both of them require some sort of the existence of the unseen. And if you have the book, this is on pages 128 through 131. And so if that is a necessary component of religion, 
then Doctor Who will fail to be a religion. Because even though you know Doctor Who has a mythos and it uh, implies that there are people, uh, there are transcendental beings or transcendent beings, there are uh, lots of the unseen spirits, uh, other universe creatures, etc. We know, and I hope this doesn't shock anyone, uh, we know that Doctor Who was written by humans uh, and it was written for a human audience. And no matter how much we love Verity Lambert and everyone else uh, involved in the show throughout the years, they are not transcendent beings because we know them. So as a result, uh, no matter, even though it posits the unseen, there is, it lacks the unseen in the same sense of a deity, some sort of divine being. So what we're left with is the idea that maybe Doctor Who is a humanist religion. So humanism, uh, though it has several different forms, sometimes uh, humanism just gets conflated with the concept of atheism. Uh, and we do know that uh, there are many humanists that are atheists, but there are several types of humanism. Uh, some theists are humanist uh, because the real focus of humanism is on the human self, right? The human as this being who's capable of rational self-thought, ethical behavior, uh, and uh, being fantastic, as the doctor says. So there are different types of humanism. I detail those in the book. I lay out some possible things. Uh, I even suggest that Doctor Who might make um, a good example of a humanist religion. As I say on page uh, 133, it definitely celebrates humans, right? It loves humans. Um, it also warns of their potential to do evil. Uh, but regardless of that sort of uh, notion, uh, it seems a stretch to try to force religion onto humanism. And so as a result, I think the best approach to do is really just to see Doctor Who as a way of life, uh, as a philosophy. And so if we do that, well, then uh, we can sidestep issues related to unseen divine beings uh, or issues that might arise out of uh, the humanist tradition. With that said, uh, there is this really, I, 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 yes, I wrote the chapter, right? I, I originally ended it there, and I was like, oh, done. But then I started thinking more and more about the deepness and richness of Doctor Who, and why, you know, why do we have this sense that it could serve as a religion? Because I'm sympathetic to that claim. I love Doctor Who, and I think it's that meaningful. But why? And I think a part of it is for the next two reasons. Uh, one is that it doesn't shy away from the depressing things related to human existence, specifically endings, uh, and that sense of impossibility that we sometimes face when we face endings. Uh, for instance, uh, we, we see with uh, Amy and Rory, they're unable to have children. That's a deeply scarring existential event, right? To, to know that you cannot participate in that process that is foundational or fundamental to the biological process of of humans and all living creatures, the reproduction, uh, that's, a, that's a deeply scarring existential event. And we see how it can affect relationships. In fact, there are lots of relationships that are ended because of it. I mean, Amy and Rory are an example. Uh, we see that other cultures that people have even been defined as being less than worthy because they were unable to procreate. And so where, you know, most dramas, most TV shows would shy away from that, we see Doctor Who embracing this, this really deep ending in life. Um, we see it embracing just endings in general, especially as we discuss the 11th Doctor. Uh, but the 10th Doctor is no different, right? At the end of it, he says, I don't want to go. And we see that this notion of death, of life ending, the, fi the final two, right? The, the just, there's nothing more, right? That's scary. That makes us think and perceive of ourselves and life 
in a different way. In fact, um, there are many philosophers, uh, many existentialists who will say that true philosophical knowledge begins once we realize that we're going to die. And for Socrates, according to Plato, philosophy is the subject, is the art, the skill that best prepares us for death. Because instead of shying away from death and these other endings in our life, it tells us how to prepare and to embrace those things. Even if they still scare us, even though if we're uncomfortable, they teach us not to run away from them like they're some Dalek. They teach us to embrace them. And Doctor Who's the same way, especially in the new series. Um, really good, uh, tragic, uh, relational writing that occurs throughout. Uh, but we find it in the, the old, the classic series too, with the loss of companions, the Doctor sacrificing himself. Um, we see that Doctor Who has a, a long-term, long-standing tradition of embracing these issues. And one of the most interesting aspects is their conception of the afterlife. Now, I detail this in a book, uh, Time and Relative Dimensions in Faith, uh, uh, Religion and Doctor Who, uh, came out several years ago, a wonderful collection by, um, oh gosh, uh, James McGrath, who's a wonderful scholar, and uh, Andrew, I want to say... Macomb, um, but I'm sorry, Andrew, if I, I got that wrong. So uh, I apologize. I'll uh, make it up to you if I ever meet you in person. So anyway, uh, it's a wonderful collection. And I detail uh, my argument about the afterlife there. But I'll, I'll briefly mention it here that in Doctor Who, whereas most accounts, most shows that I can think of are always trying to prove that there's something after death, uh, a subjective experience, a subjective life where we carry on similar to how we are now, but maybe in a different form, that in Doctor Who, uh, there's a consistent message that we should not want that, that in fact, there is no life after death, even though, again, right, there are some instances where uh, those sorts of things uh, happen. But what it suggests is that life ends. And even for time lords, uh, time lords, they have their memories, they have their experiences, they are recorded uh, perfectly in the matrix. And so there is a type of objective existence uh, that is there for other time lords to see and experience. Uh, but as for you, your life ends. And that's a vastly different approach than most uh, religions and most uh, television shows, pop culture things uh, provide. They typically want you to know that there is an afterlife. But if you think about Doctor Who, the people who try to live forever, like the master, uh, like the Cybermen, uh, etc., they're the bad guys, right? They're the ones who are evil. Uh, even Lord Barusa uh, ends up being punished for his attempt to live forever. It's uh, not until the 11th Doctor where he gets his new set of regenerations that things seem to be different uh, for the Doctor. Uh, but even that, right, that is going to have to be resolved in some way. So anyway, Doctor Who, I, I provide a, uh, I think, fairly convincing argument that Doctor Who is against subjective, a subjective immortal existence. And in fact, what it tells us is we should be happy with our life now and that we should, that should be enough, right? The earth should be enough and that hopefully uh, some way and somehow our memories, our experiences are recorded somewhere for all eternity, right? That's where I look at Charles Hartshorn and uh, who's inspired by Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy. Uh, that suggests that there's a, a divine being, uh, divine might actually be the wrong word, but there's a being who we call God who exists in our universe, but who uh, remembers all of our experiences perfectly. And so that's an interesting uh, philosophy of religion to ponder. So that really wraps up chapter six. And I know normally I would stop here, but I want to, I want to push through because I don't have a whole lot to say about chapter seven. 
And it's not because there's nothing, there's anything wrong with chapter seven. Chapter seven is fascinating. It's just not my area of expertise. And so um, what you see or what I do here is I provide an interesting uh, overview of the, uh, what's his, uh, Benjamin uh, Tippett's and David Singh's uh, article in More Doctor Who and Philosophy, where they provide a theoretical um, analysis of how we might create a TARDIS. It's really fascinating, really interesting stuff, uh, but I'm not a physicist, uh, so I, you know, I can't sit here and explain all of the intricacies. Um, it's interesting, you know, like transporters and teleporters and stuff used in Star Trek, we see that it's at least theoretically possible to have something bigger on the inside than the outside, but that uh, the power consumption to do such a thing would be astronomical. I mean, hence Doctor Who putting stars, collapsing stars, thanks to Omega or Omega, I should say. Um, you know, they, that's what powers the TARDIS is a collapsing star. Um, and so there's, you know, all of that stuff is a, another fascinating, meaningful way. And so that's why I'm, I'm tying these together because we think about the meaningful aspects we've discussed about life and death. Here we have our imaginations running abound. Um, and so that's deeply meaningful too. So in terms of Doctor Who being a religion, right, it does provide um, an outline for how we understand reality, uh, both uh, the possibilities of TARDISes uh, or parallel universes, et cetera. So uh, that's where... Um, in chapter seven, I look at that, I look at knowledge, right? And one of the things I notice uh, and, and I argue for in the book is that the doctor doesn't give us any clear argument for how we know that we know things. So that's typically how we define knowledge. However, I do provide some uh, explanations about how whatever theory of justification we're going to use, it's, it's got to be something dynamic. Uh, because the doctor seems to know things um, regardless of his ability to explain those things. And so there's some epistemologists, you know, people who study knowledge who say in order to have knowledge, you have to be able to explain how you know it. And the doctor shows that he and she is not always capable of doing that. So I suggest a amalgamation of epistemological theories, stuff like reliabilism, maybe some evidentialism, my shout out to my buddy, Kevin McCain there, uh, who uh, was frustrated, I'll say that, that I would dare use reliabilism. Uh, uh, shout out to my friend, Paula Smith, too, who taught me about reliabilism. Uh, but there you have Kevin McCain, uh, who's an evidentialist, or at least a, a type of evidentialist. Um, or at least he promotes it, right? I don't want to put words in his mouth. He's got some great books, you should read them. Um, about epistemology. So, right, I spent some time looking at that. I spent some time looking at classic arguments from Descartes, from David Hume, uh, and even contemporary arguments from people like uh, William Austin and others uh, to suggest a uh, Peter Klein and other that uh, our knowledge is based on an engagement with the world, right? Uh, so our notion of knowledge has to be tied somewhat to what we, uh, how we engage the world, right? If Doctor Who teaches us to be a flaneur, what we know needs to be similar. And so uh, that's why I'm a fan of reliabilism. I'm a fan of infinitism uh, simply because it's a fascinating theory. But I think when we put those two together, we get an intriguing concept that brings in these physical engagements, but also psychological components of knowledge. So uh, with that said, um, that's it, right? I end the book with a short epilogue where I quote Rick Sanchez from Rick and Morty, uh, which if you watch that uh, the past couple of seasons, there have been some really good quotes about how Doctor Who is the ultimate um, character, is, is ultimately in charge. And so Rick Sanchez, he, he says, I'm Doctor Who. Um, in one episode, and it's because of the complexity and his ability to get out of any situation. Uh, and so I thought that was a good way to, to really end the book on that quote, because for Doctor Who, 
for me, and I imagine for you, right, it's, it's a very spiritual, it's a very uh, emotional, it's a very practical endeavor. Uh, and so my goal was not just to sit around and talk about, pontificate about, uh, you know, how smart I am. Uh, instead, to just show, you know, how much Doctor Who's inspired my way of life, my understanding of life, my dr- desire to know more, uh, desire to make the world a better place. And I think all of those tied together uh, are related around that central concept of being a flaneur, which again is a lifelong uh, exercise. Um, but it's a good exercise. And through exercise, we grow and we become wiser and stronger. That's philosophy. That's Dr. Who. So thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. Again, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. Feel free to buy Dr. Who, uh, The Real Meaning of Dr. Who from Open Universe. There's also uh, from Cosmic Press, uh, Who Cares? My Life with Tom Baker. And of course, there is the Dr. Who and Philosophy Bigger on the Inside and more Dr. Who and Philosophy. Um, I don't remember the subtitle. <laughs> Uh, And I'm sure there's several other things out there that I've uh, been a part of if you're interested in. But anyway, uh, stay wise, be a flaneur, and I hope to see you out and about sometime. Take care. Peace.